have a word from the Lord today. The Lord's been dealing with me uh, past past several hours uh, since I woke up. But before I get into what the Lord gave me, there's something you need to understand real quick. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, he says, I would that you would be complete. He uses the word whole there. In his mind, he is seeking wholeness of the human. And this is what he refers to as wholeness. He says, I would that you would be whole in spirit. And he's, he's not saying this in any just random order. He's strategically saying what he's saying here. Spirit first is what he said. Soul and body. That word soul in the Greek is the word psyche. He's talking about your mind. And there are things that you need to understand that your spirit is the highest part of you. Your body is the lowest part of you. But your soul, your mind is caught right between the two of those. And when the Lord wants to talk to you, he's going to pick up the phone and call the mind. He's going to speak. Spirit's going to speak to mind. He wants to talk to you. When the adversary wants to talk to you, he's going to reach from the lowest part of you, which is your body. That's why when you're sick, when things are going on in the world, when you read problems on the news or social media, what does it do? It affects your soul. So what I want you to do today, before we get started, we're going to take just a few seconds here. I want you to cast down imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself above the thought of Christ Jesus. I want you to take captivity those thoughts. And the way we do that is we just don't think about them. And that's hard, isn't it? But here's what I want you to do. When you focus on the one who is above all things and you start praising him, you get a peace that comes over you that says, God, you've got all this under control. I may feel worry, but I'm not going to worry. I'm going to respond to you. So I want you to lift up your hands right now, and I want you to cast down an imagination. If you've read anything on the news, if you have seen something that has caused you frustration or fear, it's real. I'm not telling you that it's not, but I want you to focus on someone higher than our thoughts. Set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. Now with your mouth, say, God, I'm going to lock into this service today and what you're going to say. I don't want to miss a single thing because you have a word for me. So Lord, I'm going to set my mind upon heavenly things. Speak to my soul today, God. So I'm going to activate the spirit right now. I'm going to set my spirit, my soul on you. God, in your name right now, I believe that you have the light of revelation for this church and that you have a light and revelation for each individual here today. Direct them, Lord. Help them in this end time hour to be what you've called them to be. Lord, use me today, Jesus. As I've been close to you, my Father, Lord, I abide in the light. Lord, let me come with the light of revelation to illuminate the darkness that's trying to cover our earth. And Lord, let it cast out fears. Let it cast down anxieties. Every thought that would exalt itself above you. I come with dominion by you your spirit, God, not by my might, not by my study, but by your spirit. I come in this place and I take dominion and I loose angels in this house right now, Lord, to war against the thoughts of all your people and to set at liberty the captive. In your name, I give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Really, really quickly, I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 12 and I'm going to read just a few verses here. I'll stop reading when the Lord tells me to stop. But I'm going to read just a few verses. Genesis chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Thank you so much, Brother Nathaniel, Sister Brooke. I can't wait to hang out with you. But I want, to, I want to take care of some business right now. There's some things the Lord's pouring into me, and I believe it's going to help. Please lock in to what the Lord is saying. Amen. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, notice his name, Abram. Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is what he did. He departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Because what else do you do when God says do something? He departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and he had family members that went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to minister today. This isn't us. Everyone say, this isn't us. God's wanting to show the church who they are in this last hour. But the world is trying to tell us who we are. And I'm, today, I want you to get a revelation of who you are. But first, you need to realize that God has a calling on you, and we need to get a revelation that what's going on in the world, this isn't us. 
This is not us. We are something far higher than what we see around us. And the Lord's going to take today, I believe there's going to be a flood that comes in this place, and he's going to raise you above chaos that's in our world, and you're going to revelation of who you are. Now stretch forth your hands and pray that one more time. God, I'm setting my mind on you. Lord, illuminate in me what you've called me to be. I feel destinies. I feel ministries in this house. There's going to be people that are loosed after this service that are going to teach Bible studies. They're going to reach the lost that are going to intercede. I believe that there's going to be more all-night prayer meetings that the Lord brings you into. You're going to lay hands upon the sick and they're going to recover. I believe that faith is going to be poured into your people. God, I declare it in your name and we stand upon your word. Lord, let us operate in true biblical love and unity. In the precious name of Jesus, we give you praise. And one more time, just give the Lord a hand clap. Let him know you love him. You're thinking about him, and you've got your mind upon him. Praise God. You may be seated. There's something in the Bible that we need to understand that we, we really don't have a full understanding of. We read scriptures, and we hear things preached, Brother Nathaniel, that the Bible says that God is all-knowing. And so if we're really honest, that, that phrase right there, the all-knowing God, really bothers us because we have had questions. And I'm going to just shed some light on some dark things in your life. If God knows all things, then what's the point of all of this? If God really knows all things, then what are we doing here? Why doesn't God just rapture us out of here? Because he knows who's going to be saved. And we have entire people groups and religions that believe and preach and have written books on this doctrine of there is a select few that God has already set aside that they're going to be saved and so on and so forth. And they call this predestination. And we have been confused. We don't know how to answer those questions. But let me just reveal to you that God knows only the future of the submitted ones. He only knows. Now let me help you with this because I'm going to be saying some things that you may not have heard before. God does not know all things about you unless you give him access to know all things. In Genesis, he was in perfect relationship with Adam and Eve. He knew them. He was close to them. He knew everything about them. They were following the one and only commands to be in relationship with him, to not eat from the tree of knowing good and evil. But the moment that mankind was unsubmitted to God, they withheld some things from God, and God turned his face away from them. That's what the prophet said. He said he turned his face away. And when God turns his face away, he chooses not to see some things. And that's why the Bible says the, the Spirit of God came blowing in the wind in the cool of the day, and he said, Adam, Eve, where are you? You're no longer submitted to me. How does this work? God has all power as well as all knowledge. So God can use all of his power to not know. He does it every single time you repent. When you repent, he says, I don't see that sin anymore. It's been covered in the blood. So he can use his power to not know some things. And so to know where Adam and Eve were, Adam and Eve had to submit to a voice calling. He said, Adam, Eve, where are you? And they came out from behind a blessing. The tree was their blessing, and they were hiding from God behind something given unto them to bless them with. And thankfully, Adam and Eve stepped out. And watch what they do. They confess. They said, the tree which you've given unto us, we ate it. Yeah, they did a lot of blame because that's humanity. They were now more human than they'd ever been because now they were rebellious. And so they, they blamed each other. They blamed the serpent. They blamed the devil, all of that good stuff. But what God was waiting to hear from the human was, I ate from the tree. I failed. And at that moment, God was in relationship. It's like my wife and I, I didn't know anything about her until we got in relationship. And then we started learning about one another because we were in relationship. But up until that point, there were things I just did not know about my spouse. And this is why a lot of people don't want to get married because they don't understand commitment. I need to know everything before I get married. Well, look what Jesus did. He said, while you were yet sinners, I went ahead and died for you. Before I even knew what decision you would make from the unsubmitted ones, I just went ahead and died. That's how much I loved you. So what God does to show us ourselves and to show us us is he comes and he says, I've withheld some things from myself. I don't know what decision you're going to make today, Abram. I'm just going to put the call out there and you're going to show me what you're going to do. And to show God some things, we have to endure some tests. 
God put a tree in the garden to test Adam and Eve to see if they would obey. Because without that tree, obedience is really just easy. And so God put a tree there and he said, I've given them a a command. Now let's see if they will do what I have asked. There's going to be a tree there that's going to prove to me daily how serious they are about me. God tests his people. He tests his people. I'll prove it to you. Ecclesiastes 3.18 says this. He says, God tests mankind to prove to them that they are but animals. Think of that next time you guys are working out and you say, man, I'm a beast. <laughs> uh, when the Bible calls someone an animal, that was never a good thing. God allowed false prophets in Canaan. He said, I will not remove the false prophets. I will leave them to test my people to see if they will obey my word. Judges 3, he says, I'm going to leave the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Philistines. I'm going to leave all these people in this land to test them. To see if they will at all obey all my words. God tests his people. I'd like to call it our tree test. We have trees planted all in our midst. That the word of God has told us not to eat from. And what we're doing is we're going and we're failing our test. And we're taking from things that God never designed us to take from. And we're showing him how much of that word we know. And how submitted we really are. And it's in those moments that God turns his face away and he says, I don't see them anymore. They're no longer mine. You may prophesy, you may do all these works, but you're not mine because you're not obeying me. Tests all in the world. And God is looking at us and he's saying, that isn't you. That's not what I designed. This isn't you. So our opening text, we're reading about Abram. Now that we've established this this understanding of tests, We need to understand this aspect of God or we're going to be very aggravated him in the end times because he's testing us right now in this end time hour and there are droves of people blowing it. God has not called us to be divided. We're blowing it over a four inch piece of cloth. God has called us to love people. We're blowing it over a needle. God is testing his church And he's looking at it and he's saying, where are my people? I don't see them. This isn't us. So in context, if you read Genesis 11, just some, I like to, I like to do Bible trivia. Does anybody know what Genesis 11 is all about? What's the fame? It's a famous story right there. It's the Tower of Babel. It's a group of people that said, let us build us a tower. Let us make us a name. Let's build something so big and we'll make our names great. Let's do this. In mass unity, people are coming together with a singular cause. Let's build a tower so high because if a flood ever comes back through here, we're going to escape that thing. So let's build a high tower. Let's go and be like gods. History has proven to us that this is where world religions began. Polytheism was not a thing until the Tower of Babel. They started teaching the sun god. They started teaching all of the Egyptian religions started there, the Babylonian. All of these religions started right here in this setting. And it was a rebellious people. It's, in fact, the man who built that, the one who was the general contractor of this tower, his name was Nimrud. And what the Bible said is he faced the Lord. And that seems like it's a good thing, right? He faced the Lord. That's wonderful. That means he was so rebellious that he dug his heels and he said, God, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want. And watch this. These people are rebellious. And watch what God does. He says, let me go down there to see if all that I've been hearing is true. You see, I thought you were an all-knowing God. I thought you knew everything. He said, no, those aren't my people. I'm I'm not in relationship with them. I don't know anything that's going down there. I've withheld that from myself until they turn their face to me, humble themselves, and repent. Then I can go down there and heal their land. But right now, they're just in total rebellion. That's not them. That's not my image. That's some warped, distorted version of what I made in the garden. And so his presence comes down, and he sees. He goes, ah, I liked the unity. That's what drew me here, but your purpose is all off. This isn't you. And so in a context of global division, that's the context right here. In a context of global division, God then goes looking for someone who's willing to submit to him. And the very next chapter is where we read about Abram. He says, Abram, we're in a divided world. We're in a group of total rebellion and anarchy. I need someone to be what I've designed them to be. 
I'm asking you, go out of your country. Leave that society. Come out of there from your family even, from your father's house, into a land that I will show you. And those people that are trying to make their name great, here's what I'll do. If you will follow me, listen to his words, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. But don't build a tower, build an altar. This isn't you. So watch this first phrase. That in the Bible, in English, it says, Abram, go out. It's, in Hebrew, it's, it's worded a lot better. It says, Avram lech lecha, which literally says, go to yourself. <laughs> go to you. Essentially, what God was doing is he came and he looked at a society and he said, oh, that's not you, Abram. That's not what I designed. That's not you. There's a voice blowing in the wind calling you out. Babylon, Babel is your test. Past that test. Go past it. This isn't you. If you'll leave there, I'll show you you. Go out. Lech lecha means go to yourself. And Abram stepped out and stepped into relationship. And he was 75 years old. Go home and read this and study it out. You can fact check me. I don't ever tell people to just take my word for it. Go study it for yourself. But I'm bold enough to preach it. So there you go. Go read it yourself though and just fact check me. He was tested a total of 10 times in his life. Nine tests, he blew it. And watch this. The Bible says he called him out of Haran. That was east. Where was Adam and Eve cast out? Towards the east. He was living in an eastern country, and God said, go to yourself, go west. Directly west of Haran was Bethel, the house of God. And watch what happens. Abram leaves Haran, and he stops in the middle. He does not go to Bethel. He does not go to the house of God. He goes from there, and he stops here, and he says, okay, at least I'm not in my world anymore. Somewhere in the middle is good enough, right? The Bible said he settled in the city of Ai. The Hebrew word for Ai is a heap of trash. He was living between the house of God and the world but living in a heap of trash. And I think it's poetic that that's where division between him and Lot started. And he looked at Lot and there was striving amongst them. He says, no, no, we're brethren. That's all that happens when you live somewhere in between the house of God and the world. You live in a heap of trash. Division is always going to be there. You're going to war and you're going to strive with each other because you haven't fully submitted to the house of God. But you feel good about it because at least you're not living in the world. You're just somewhere stuck in the middle. And for 15 years, the Bible says he travels north and south. He goes to Hebron, and he goes to, in the Bible, it says he went down to the Negev. That's just the Hebrew word for south. He's traveling north and south when God called him to the house. And so for 15 years, he's going north and south, living in between the house of God and the world, living in a heap of trash. He settled in a place called Egypt. In Egypt, that, that word in Hebrew, it's Mithraim. It means stuck place. He was stuck for 15 years. He was tested nine times in 15 years, and he failed all of them. He was promised that he would be Avraham, which in Hebrew that means a father of a multitude. That was the name that God gave him. He said, today I'm going to tell you who you are. You're not Abram. Thank you for leaving. You're still halfway, but I'm going to get you over there. I'm going to contend with you. And thankfully, we see the grace of God dealing with humanity, still giving grace. But we can abuse grace for 15 years when day one we could have lived over there. God wanted him to go there on day one. Abram's wheel said, no, I'm going to stay somewhere in between here. I'm not going to go from east to west. I'm going to go north and south and just stay stuck for 15 years. And so what happens is he finally starts moving that direction through tests. I'm a father of a multitude. I'm too old. My wife can't have kids, so let me go and sleep with my handmaid. And the Bible says a wild man was conceived because that's what happens when we do it our way. Things go in, go in total chaos. God was calling him here. And watch what happens just to, after 15 years of absolutely blowing it. Watch this. He goes in, verse 22, and it says, Now it came to pass after these things, 15 years of blowing it, nine tests, that God tested Abraham and said, 
Abraham, or in Hebrew, father of a multitude. And watch what he says. Here I am. That, that's not a locational word in Hebrew. It says ha-nani. That means that's me, is what it said in Hebrew. Father of a multitude. I'm going to test you one last time. You're still living in a heap of trash when I've called you to my house. Father of a multitude. That's me. And watch what God says. He said, oh, I'm going to test to see if that's really you. Do you really believe the name I've put on you? Do you really believe that I've called you father of a multitude? Yes, Lord, that's who I am. I believe in the name. I trust the name that you put on me. All right, we'll go sacrifice your son, your only son, the one whom you love. Do you really believe that that's you, that that's what I said? I need to see if you really believe it. I don't know if you really believe it yet because you're not, you're not fully submitted to me yet. You're still living in between, so I need to see it today. I've withheld my sight from the future because you're not fully submitted. Show me that that's you. And so watch what Abraham does. Then he said, now take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Literally, he uses lech lecha yet again. He said, this still isn't you. The only two times the Lord uses that phrase, lech lecha, was when he called him out of the world and when he was calling him to the church. He said, this still isn't you here in this stuck place. Come up a little higher. And so watch what happens. Real quick, Bible trivia. How many trees were in the garden? Two. The tree of life and the tree of knowing good and evil. They failed at one of the trees. Now watch this. There's no Hebrew word for uh, wood. The Bible says that he put wood upon the back of the lad, the sacrificial son, right? In Hebrew, it says tree because they don't have a Hebrew word for wood. He put a tree on his back and he said, we're going up to a, that hill, that cursed hill where my son is supposed to die. And so they go up to that mountain. They got the tree. He rose early the next morning, the Bible said. It seems like he's convinced this is me. Do you know what that mountain was? It was Bethel. He said, today, after 15 years, I'm going to the house of God. No matter what it costs, I'm tired of living in this place. This isn't me. That wasn't me. Thank you, God, for saving me from the world. Thank you, God, for bringing me into this holy place. But I must have the holy of holies. I must go ever, ever so deeper than I've ever been. I'm tired of being stuck living in a heap of trash. I'm tired of this filthy world. Yes, I'm not in that, but I'm not where I'm supposed to be either. And so he starts traveling up to Bethel with a sacrificial son, even though his name was father of a multitude. But something finally burned in his head. I trust the name that he has given me. I trust the name he has put on me. I am father of a multitude. Daddy, or what's going to happen? I don't see a sacrifice here. Why is the wood on me? Son, he's going to provide a sacrifice today. They get up there, and the Bible says he laid his son upon the tree. And then all of a sudden, he rears back with that knife. In Hebrew, it's starting to slow down. The, the way the sentence structure starts, it's getting slower. It's in slow motion. And you see this man whose name is father of a multitude, the name given to him by God. He's raising a knife to take his son, his only son, the one whom he loves. And then all of a sudden, booming from heaven was the name. Father of a multitude, father of a multitude, don't take thy son, thy only son, for now I know. I see you now. And this is what he says. Right when God says, Father multitude, Father multitude, this was Abraham's response. Ha, nani, that's still me. I'm proving to you that I trust you. I'm proving to you that I believe in the name. And he says, oh, now I know. You're fully submitted today. Enjoy the house of God. Your son, who you were willing to give to me by faith, is laying upon a tree. Turn and look behind you. There's another tree on this holy mountain. You made it to the holy of holies. You're in Eden right now. There's another tree. I know it says thicket in the Bible in English, but it says tree in Hebrew. He said there's a substitute in that other tree. Which one are you going to pick? Show me if you're going to pass your tree test today. And Abraham says, this is a no-brainer. Of course I'll take the substitute. Because if I choose the substitute, my son lives. Tested. And finally, he said, this is me, God. 
Who you called over there, that wasn't me. Who got stuck for all those years, that wasn't me. I'm showing you me today. I trust you in spite of all of this world, this divided world that you, you have seen. You came down and you tested them. We see it with his nephew, Lot, as well. Lot goes a different route than Abraham. While Abraham is being tested on heels and living in the Holy of Holies because he's passing it, because he's showing God who he is, Lot is living in a place where this is what God says. He said, the cry coming up unto this place is great. I've heard it from heaven. I will now go down to see if all I've heard is true. You can go read it. That's what he said about Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, that's an unsubmitted city. I can't see if any of that's true. I hear the voice of an accuser crying up about the city. I hear that there's absolute filth, sexual misconduct in that city. Let me go down and see if all that is true. The word see is tied into the word test there. And what does he do? He sends two of his angels to test them. They were entertaining angels unaware, had no idea they were there. And they tried to take those angels and sleep with them. And God said, it's all true. Everything I've heard, I see it myself. They even tried to defile the supernatural. And they were blinded. And they were beating on the door of Lot's house looking for the supernatural. But they were so unsubmitted and so carnal that they couldn't even get into the door to get to the supernatural. They couldn't even find the door, the Bible said. Because that's what happens to a church, to a group of people that are unsubmitted to God's full plan. They're looking, where's the supernatural? Where's the angelic? You'll never find that door, living unsubmitted. And they didn't. Only Lot, he was testing them. And he says, I'm going to go down there and test them and show them that they are but animals. They're just looking for their next meal. They're just looking to fulfill their hungers of their flesh. They're animals. They failed their tree test. I want to tell you about a particular human who passed his tree test. Jesus shows up one day. And the Bible says he was baptized by John. And the spirit in Mark 2 thrust him towards the east into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. And he was with the wild beast. That word tempted in Greek means tested. He went and he was tested of every manner of temptation. Every sin on this filthy planet, Jesus was faced with it. Why? Why would Jesus endure all of that? Because if he could pass the test, then he would have dominion over the tester. And he could relieve and redeem those of us being tested. So Jesus would be tempted with lust, yet without sin. Homosexuality. Yet without sin. It says every manner of test, did it not? Every test, he passed it. And he was gaining power. And when he came out of that wilderness, he was hungered. And angels came and ministered to him. And they said, you passed this test today. So that now when you put your spirit in your church, they too can pass their tests. You're showing us how to be us. This isn't us. And so Jesus walks the earth. And the Bible says after the wilderness, he was given all authority all power, everything. The only thing left to conquer was death. And he would beat that on a tree. There's a Greek word for cross. They didn't use it. Why would they use the Greek word tree when there's a word for cross? He said, I'm going to pass the test and I'm going to be the sun hanging on a tree and I'll be the one that will relieve you from your test. And one day his disciples asked him, said, Lord, how should we pray? He said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted against us. And deliver us from, the Greek word is test. Deliver us from the test. Teach us how to be us by passing this test. And so Jesus walks this earth as the one who passed the test. And he's going to Bethel, which is heaven. He says, but before I go to heaven, let me contend in this stuck place with you for a little while. And let me show you you. This is the image to which I've called you to be in. He comes and he looks at a leper and he says, that's not you. Be healed. They look at extreme racism. They hated Samaritans, and he goes and sits down with a Samaritan woman, harlot, and he's sitting with her because she's had multiple husbands. And he's sitting there, and he says, this isn't you. 
This isn't who you are. And the disciples gather around offended because he's sitting with somebody of an ethnicity they hated. And he looked at his disciples. He goes, that's not you. This is what you should be doing right here. He goes and he calls a Hellenistic Matthew who was working for Rome. And he looks at, at Matthew and he says, that's not you working for Rome. That's not who you are. That's not what I've designed you to be. That's not you. He calls an Essene, Mark, who is ultra conservative in that world. And he says, that's not you. Follow me. He looks at Peter and he says, that's not you you're not a fisherman put the nets down follow me and he starts showing a group of 12 men who we're supposed to be he finds a Judas and he says I see you that you're over money and you're trying to make Israel great again because that's what he wanted to do he was a zealot he was a nationalist he was killing Romans to get them out so they can make Israel what it used to be he was literally trying to make Israel great again and he said that's not you come and follow me I don't want you to follow the world's political views that's not you Follow me. I'll show you you if you can put all of these things aside. And watch what Jesus does. He calls 12 people together from the ages of 17 to 21, and they fought like cats and dogs. Who's going to sit on your right and your left when you bring in your kingdom? Lord, I want you to be like Solomon. Get you a big throne. Get Get Rome out of here so you can make Israel great again. Lord, let me sit on your left and right. And he goes, you have no idea what you're saying. I got two thieves reserved for those chairs. One's going to die in his sin. One is going to die to his sins because I died for their sins. You don't want to sit on my left and right. You don't want the throne I'm about to sit on. I'm going to give you the call to take up your throne and follow me. But you're not going to like the one I sit on. You're going to be extremely offended by the crown that I'm getting ready to wear. You're not going to like my royal robes. They're going to have blood on them. They're going to be torn. Let me show you how to be you. What are you, Jesus? He says, the world will know who you are. They're going to know you. And they're going to see me in you when you love one another. Yeah, but Jesus, what about Mark, that, that extreme conservative guy? That's not him. Okay, well, what about Judas, the extreme zealot who's trying to make Israel great again? That's, that's not him. Okay, Jesus, what, what about Matthew, who's working for Rome? Extreme liberal. That's not him. I'm trying to show you who you are. That's not you. Get out of this stuck place and go a little higher. This isn't you. Well, God, I, I let my nets down. Wasn't that enough? I left the fishing business. I left the tax collecting tables. I repented of all that to follow you. Is that not enough? He said, no, that's still not you. Congratulations, come dying to an altar, getting filled with my spirit. Now go in the world and start looking like my spirit. That's not you. That's not you. All this fighting, all this battling, all this arguing, that's not us. That's not us. I was in prayer a few weeks ago. I say a few weeks, it was several months ago. And I was on my knees and I was just praying. I said, God, what is going on in our world? It was so divided. We've got church members over here saying this. We've got church members over there saying that. We've got church members here in the middle saying this. We've got that denomination who we would call liberal. We've got that denomination who seems conservative. We've got this denomination who seems neutral. What is what? Where are you at? What is what? And this is what God told me. He said, that's not mine. You notice the water that when it left Eve or Eden? The Bible said when it was flowing through Eden, it was one river. But when it left Eden, it divided into four. Because whatever leaves that most holy place, that holy of holies, where two trees are, that mountaintop, according to Ezekiel, whenever we leave that place and we come here, we're always going to be divided. We cannot be one people, as Jesus prayed in the garden, let them be one, as we are one. We'll never attain that. When we leave garden places. Because we're content with living in stuck places. Somewhere in between the altar I died for my sins. But I'm not quite ready to go that far yet. So let me just stay here. And I'll tell you what's keeping us right here. Your opinions. Not Bible. 
We're saying a lot of things we think are Bible, but it's really a lot of opinion. Let's just be honest. Can we just be honest today? It's really our opinions. And we're divided over opinion when God has called us much higher. This isn't us. Go to yourself. Well, what am I supposed to be like? Paul said, I would that you would grow up in stature and to the fullness of of the image that is Christ Jesus into his head. How do I become him? Well, Jesus said, let me show you what you are. Who is my neighbor? Oh, you're not going to like my answer. Notice the person who asked him, well, who is my neighbor? You're telling me I need to love my neighbor. Who is my, because that's what, that's what religion asks. Let me put it into a dogma. Let me put it into a, a, a protocol. Let me put it onto a list. If I'm supposed to love my neighbor, let me write it into a bylaw who is ex- exactly a neighbor. So who is my neighbor if I'm supposed to love my neighbor? This was a Jewish Pharisee asking that question. And Jesus said, you're not going to like this answer at all. Let me give you a little parable so I can ease you into it because I don't want to completely peel your face off here in a second. So I'll just ease you into it with a story so that you won't get that offended at me. So here's what, this is the story. There was a man beaten and left half dead one day and there was a really spiritual man who thought he was living over here because of the way he looked and the job position that he had as priest. And when he saw that man beaten half for dead, he went on the other side of the road and he goes, no, I'm just, if I don't look, maybe I won't see that. But then there was another man who was a Pharisee who knew the law, knew all that stuff. He was on this side of it. And he walked by and he goes, maybe if I just walk on the side of the road, I don't have to deal with the problem of my world. But there was a good Samaritan. Whoa, wait. The Samaritans aren't really Jews, this man would have thought. He's talking to a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee. There was a good Samaritan. There are no good Samaritans in the Jewish mindset. We hate Samaritans. They're fake pseudo-Jews. They built their own temple trying to be like Jews, but they didn't have Jewish blood. They were half-breeds. And they're like, wait, there are no good Samaritans. He said, no, you've missed this whole thing. Let me show you you through somebody you don't like. And this good Samaritan picked him up and carried him and brought him to an inn, spent his money. And then he turns and looks at the, the innkeeper and he says, whatever you spend more on this man, when I return, I'll repay you. That's your neighbor. And so I was, I was praying about all this division in our world, all these problems. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, there has been a voice crying up from the accuser of the brethren, your adversary. Adversary in, in Greek is antidikos. It means a criminal attorney. There's a voice in the courtroom that testified against Job, and it testifies every day against the church. He's the accuser of the brethren. He is the the criminal attorney. And this is what his voice was saying. I was in prayer, and I heard this voice crying out, Brother Nathaniel. And his voice cried out. He said, the church is divided, God. The church hates each other. The church doesn't want to sit with the sick. The church doesn't love other ethnicities. The church is divided. The church is divided. And God says, I've withheld my knowledge because they're not submitted either, so I cannot see. So what I'll do is I'll send them problems to test them to see if everything you're saying is true. When God spoke that to me, he told me, he said, this pandemic has been allowed by me to see if everything that accuser has said is true about the church. If you've been praying, God, I want things to go back to normal, rather than God heal the sick, this is where you live. That's not you. If you have been warring over a mask, if you've been warring over shots and you're divided, then you've been tested, you've been weighed, you've been measured, and you've been found empty. That's not you. So who are you? What am I supposed to be? I'm being tested in this season. The pandemic, the government, governors, politicians, all of that are tree tests that we have been plucking from. And we've been eating. We've been consuming media, CNN, CDC, Fox News, social media. We've been just consuming stuff that doesn't even concern the church. Our job is the gospel. That's our job. I had somebody text me the other day and they said, hey, have you gotten vaccinated yet? 
And immediately, I've got tons of opinions that none of you are going to hear about. I'm not going to tell you my opinion. This is what I told him. I said, I laughed. I said, well, bro, I said, I've been inoculated with grace because we've got a sin pandemic in my world. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and preach the gospel to people because that's, that's my concern. I'm sticking to what I know, the gospel. That's what I'm going to stick to. So I'm not, notice what I did. I didn't give you an answer of what you should or shouldn't do. Because that doesn't matter right now. Do I think things are leading in a terrible direction? Absolutely. But what do I do when things are going in a terrible direction? I get out of this stuck place where this divided world is. And I go to him and I say, God, let me tell them about you. Show me Bible for it, preacher. I'd love to. There's a particular scripture where they come and ask him, do you realize the most divisive topic in the days of Jesus was taxes? Should we pay him or should we not? We're Israel. That's not our government. But there were some people in that world who wanted government. They wanted, the, they wanted more of a democracy, even though Israel was a kingdom at that point. And so they said, we want a little bit more of a democracy. Rome's doing really well at this whole democracy thing. Let's invite them in and we'll just have them stay here. We'll pay them taxes and we'll get some military support out of it. That was the whole, that's the history of Israel right there. Rome's going to provide us help. If anybody ever comes to war against us, we'll have help from Rome. And I know history. Rome did not help them. They actually destroyed them later on. So I get it. I get the whole democracy. I get the whole king, the whole government thing. But watch what they do. They come and ask him because it was a heavily contended topic. Should we pay taxes to Rome or should we not? Should we be Israel and Israel only? Or should we have an amalgamation of two, two governments put together? What should we do? They were smart when they asked. This is how smart the Pharisees were because they knew. We, he's got a Hellenist following him and he's got an Essene following him. He'll lose followers. If he answers yes, we should pay taxes, he's going to lose Mark, his disciple. If he answers, no, we shouldn't pay taxes, this is what's going to happen. He's going to lose Matthew, his follower. We'll divide his little church of 12 by answering one question. If Jesus picks a side, he loses today. And his little church is divided and he loses all credibility. So they ask him, who should we pay taxes to? Should we pay it to Rome or not? And Jesus, so smart. <laughs> I love his answer. He says, go get me a coin. Bring that to me. And they bring him that coin, and he looks at it, and he says, whose image is that right there on that coin? And they say, well, that's the image of Caesar. Oh, good. Well, here, go give that back to Caesar, then. That's his image. That belongs to him. And they knew it. They was like, yes, we just split his church in half. He chose a side. And he goes, no, no. <laughs> give unto God what is God's. Whose image are you made in? What? Notice what he did. He did not even address the, t the topic he says this, he says, I'm going to focus your question on something higher. I'm not living in this stuck place. That's not me. I'm going to focus all of my attention to something far higher than this politicized question you just asked me. His church was maintained. He went to that last supper and he tested his disciples. Brother Nathaniel, come up here, come up here. He says, you know, I've got John here who really loves John the Baptist. You're an ultra-conservative, John, but you've gotten a revelation. You're going to be the only one today sitting on my lap listening to my heartbeat. You're going to know more than anybody else. In fact, I'm going to give you inside information. You're going to lean over and ask me, who's the deceiver at the table? And because you're not a gossiper, because you're sitting on my lap listening to my heart, I'll tell you things nobody else knows because I can trust you to discern a spirit because you won't destroy the one who's entertaining the spirit. I'll tell you and you only. John, you don't know this yet, but you're going to write a gospel someday. You're going to tell the world about me and you're going to say, I was an eyewitness of these things. You're not just going to write a gospel. You're going to write an epistle. You're going to preach to the church. And this is what you're going to tell them. When you love your brother, you abide in the light. But whenever you hate your brother, you walk in darkness. And I've already put it in your soul. You're going to write it because you got a revelation. But here's the thing. Because you got a revelation, you're going to do more than any other gospel writer. You're going to write a gospel about me, an epistle to the church, as well as you're going to get a revelation of what's to come. Because you truly love. I'll call you John the Beloved. Mark, you've been following the Essenes. You're ultra conservative. Come to my table. Brother, come here. He says, okay. Peter, I know you. I know you're a zealot. You're a nationalist in Jewish culture. You want to make Israel great again, but you're above killing people. 
So because you've got a, a revelation of love, but not the full revelation of love, you'll get to preach the gospel message. I'm not going to give you a revelation, though. You don't understand my full love. He does. He's going to get all of that. But you're going to preach Pentecost. Woo, yeah, boy, I'm going to preach Acts 2. And that's enough for some of us when we could have access. Brother, if you can come help me. All right, I've got Peter. I've got Mark. I've got John. Judas. <laughs> Somebody has to fill this role. Judas, you're a nationalist. You really... You're going to be extremely offended with me. You thought this whole time, all of you really thought that I was coming to actually build a temple, to sit on a throne like Solomon, to actually rule as a king here on earth. And you thought that I was going to kick Rome out. I'm dealing with the spirit behind Rome. I'm dealing with the spirit behind Israel. I'm here to take care of something far bigger than the problems you're dealing with. There's still going to be division when I leave. Rome, you're still going to have to contend with them. You're still going to have to contend with Pharisees. I'm not wiping the planet. I'm not coming to rule with an iron fist. I'm not going to set up my scepter and rule all these people. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave and I'm going to send my spirit. You're not going to know how to do this until I send my spirit and put it inside of you. You guys are going to be kings and priests in my stead. That's you. That's who you are. This is you. But to do that, you're going to have to come out of the world, out of the stuck place, and you're going to have to go into an upper room. And I'm going to pour my spirit on you. But Judas, you're going to be extremely offended, and so is Peter. You're going to leave me. Before the rooster crows three times, you're going to walk away because you're going to get a revelation in a few hours that I'm going to sit on a very different throne than you thought I'd sit on. I'm testing your motives, but here's what I did. Remember that prayer I told you? That communal prayer? It wasn't, Lord, deliver me from this test. Deliver us from temptation. I've prayed for you that you pass the test. You're going to be sifted as wheat. But I'm not just preaching a sermon and not living it. The prayer I told you I would pray, I'm going to keep praying it. In fact, I'm going to ever live to make intercession for my people. You starting to see how the Bible works? I've prayed for you that you pass the test. You're going to pass it. You're going to walk away because you're going to be offended at me that I'm actually going to go die, sit on a cross, and wear a crown of thorns. You're going to say to yourself, that's not how you fix the problems. you got to kick Rome out. You're going to have to go and pick it. You're going to go ahead, hold signs up. We want Rome out. I'm going to show you how we're going to deal with Rome. My first outpouring of water that pours out is going to be on a man who voted for Caesar. That's where my water is going to pour. You want to follow the flow of the water? Watch where it pours out here in a few hours. But Judas, you're going to sell me. You're going to be that foolish virgin who went to the marketplace in my parable. While my wise ones still had oil of compassion and fire of presence, you're going to run out of compassion. You have no more oil left. And so you're going to go to a marketplace looking to buy it. You're going to go try to make some money off of me, mercy. And I'm not going to answer the door. I'm going to be gone. But John, watch this. Let me show you you. Out of your belly is going to flow rivers of living water. There's going to be an end time harvest, an outpouring. Here in 50 days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Let me show you what it looks like. Everyone sit down. Let's wash feet today. Wait, Jesus. What for? This is my body. This is my body. You're my body. They're going to, this is you. This is how you love one another. They're going to know that you've been with me. By what you do, we're going to wash feet. And John is sitting there thinking to himself, wait, uh, Judas? And this is where the revelation of love really boiled up to a head in John's life. Where he says, okay, I'm getting ready to see my Savior. He's going to show me how I'm supposed to be. And Jesus gets down on his knees. And Peter says, wait, what, what are you doing? That's not how we do things. And he says, if you don't wash feet, you have no part in me. You cannot abide in me. And he who abides in me abides in love. Without me, he that doesn't abide in me is a tree that's been cut off, cast into the fire, and he withers away. If you want to be in me, this is where I'm at. And he takes off his shoes. And John watches as Jesus hits his knees. King of all the universe, who thought it not robbery, Paul said, to come and humble himself to the people made in his image. And he comes down here and he says... 
this is you. And he pours water upon the feet of the one who he knew was going to betray him because he already told it to John. And John is sitting there and he said, this is truly good news. This is who we are. This is how I'll be. He's going to die for us. And John got the revelation. There's no throne, is there, Jesus? There's no getting Rome out of here, is there, Jesus? The problems will persist, won't there, Jesus? And he said, yes, you're getting it, John. You're understanding it. But this is how you endure to the end. When the love of many begins to wax cold, this is your endurance. You love people in spite of what they say, in spite of what they post on social media, in spite of how they act, in spite of their opinions. Don't even address it. You've been watching me, John. You saw, you heard my answer that I didn't even attend the politicized remarks. I turned everything heavenward because that's our focus. You can either die with the dead or you can live with the living. I'm about to go to a tree and I'm going to pass my tree test on behalf of you. But let's go into a prayer meeting together. John, you're going to come a little deeper with me. Mark, you're going to come a little deeper with me. Peter, you're going to come a little deeper with me. I'm going to pray after this foot washing. We understand it. Judas, while we're over here living in the Holy of Holies, you're going to go and sell me. And you're going to live at this dimension right here. You're going to have an outer court. You're going to go into the wilderness. An outer court, a holy place, but a most holy place where Jesus is over here praying on our behalf. And he comes out and he looks at them asleep in this last hour before the Son of Man would leave. And he comes, he says, could you not watch and pray with me for an hour? Pray that you enter not into temptation. I'm about to be tested. Are you not practicing my prayer and praying? Deliver him from the test. I'm going to pass the test, but your test is coming. You're going to hang from a cross as well, Peter. So I'm praying for you this whole time. Could you not pray with me? When was the last time you prayed for your neighbors to pass their test? When was the last time you prayed for someone? With, when was the last time you fasted 30 days for this pandemic? Because people are dying saying, when was the last time you were in an all-night prayer meeting? Lord, help us be the church you called us to be. Take us out of the stuck place into the Holy of Holies. When was the last time you was woken up at the middle of the night and God put somebody on your heart to intercede for? Lord, they're being tested right now. Help them to pass the test. Or do we gossip about the testers because it looks like they'll fail? This isn't us. We are not a divided church. We do not participate in the politicized remarks of our world. What do we say? What do we talk about? We speak only the gospel. Because that's what Jesus told. He said, in the last days, iniquity is going to abound. And the love of many is going to wax cold. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And those that endure, what is endurance? Love. Because the context is, there's going to be a lot of people not loving each other. And the verse before that was, he said, offenses are going to come. There's going to be pestilence in the land. And iniquity is going to abound. That word iniquity means lawlessness is going to abound. Don't participate in your opinion on why it's lawless. Endure to the end. Go wash feet. Go have compassion. Pour grace on the Democrat. Pour mercy on the Republican. Speak with them. Talk with them. Meet with them. Sit with sinners because I came for the sick. For the well have no need of a physician. Sit with the ones you don't agree with. Call a Hellenist, Matthew. Call yourselves an ultra conservative, Mark. Call yourselves one that even might betray you and wash his feet anyway. This is you. This is who you are. You are my church. You are my body. And watch what he says. He said, but he that endures to the end. If you love in spite of the world not loving anymore, the gospel shall be preached to every nation. Our message has not changed. Our methods are changing and we're trying to adapt to this crazy world we're living in. But our message is still the same. There is good news. There was a man that even washed the feet of a Judas with hopes. Maybe he'll choose me. Maybe he'll come a little deeper. Watch and pray with me that you don't fail this test. You're going to be tested. And so watch this. All of this, they scatter and he goes. He hangs himself. We should weep over the man who hung himself at the selling of Jesus. Rather than saying, that's what you get. That's what happens when you sell Jesus. We should mourn when the man hangs himself. We should be burdened when the church scatters all over the globe. We should be burdened when Peter says, nope, nope, that's not my Jesus. We should be praying 
John, though, 17-year-old boy, is standing there. And here's the revelation I want to pour on you. 17-year-old boy sitting there looking at Jesus. While, while we have 17-year-old boys who are watching horror movies and seeing death, John was looking at the death of Jesus. He said, oh, it's my Savior up there. I'm not leaving your side. Even though ever, all the church left, uh, the beloved's still here. And this is what Jesus does. He says, John, that's my mom right there. That's a bride right there. That's a mother who birthed a spirit right there. You get to watch her. You get to take care of her. You, the one with the revelation, you, the one who didn't leave my side, you can watch the mother who will birth the spirit. Only these people get to take care of the church. The church is the mother who births babies. People come in here, get filled with the Holy Ghost. But we need the spirit of John to watch the church. What we've got is a bunch of Judases washing churches, watching these churches. Can I make some money off the church? We need a John who says, I love this body. I love this bride. I love the people that are going to come into this place and be born again. I love everything about it. Can God trust you with the church? Can he trust you? And in this context, everybody scatters. And some Pharisees come out of the woodworks. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus. And this is what it says. Joseph went to Pilate. And the Bible said he craved the body of Christ. John, you're going to be Jesus now. He says, I want that body more than anything. I want Jesus. I need him. There's no value to him. He's dead. He said, I don't care. I need his body. You're going to, you, you understand the law, Joseph, that if you go and you grab that body, you can't participate in Sabbath because anyone who touches a dead body cannot be ceremonially clean to participate in the Sabbath. I understand. I don't care about the law right now. I care about the broken body of Jesus. There's no affirmation. He's not going to perform a miracle for you. I don't care. I want the body of Jesus. He's not going to preach a good sermon to you. I don't care. I want the body of Christ. He is broken. I don't care. I want the body of Christ. He's dead. I don't care. I need the body of Christ. And he comes and he grabs him and brings him to his tomb. And so my question to this church is, in this end time hour, this is the type of personality that went and craved the body of Christ before he left. And the Lord spoke to me and said, it'll be the same spirit that will be activated in the end times that will inaugurate my coming who craves the body of Christ Paul said no you're not that you are the body of Christ who goes out there and sits with somebody who gives no affirmation who goes out there and bleeds all over you their opinion their hurts their emotions who sits with the hurting do we sit in churches or do we sit in houses reaching the hurting to bring them into the church because we love so much that we've been trusted with the church? This isn't us. Sitting in a building isn't us. Just sitting here and hearing good preaching isn't us. Just staying in one room and then going back to our houses and living a life every week. That's a stuck place. This isn't us. Go a little deeper. Where is the spirit flowing? It's flowing to the nations. It's flowing to the hurting. It's flowing to somebody who voted different than you. It's flowing to somebody who got inoculated and you don't agree with it. Someone who didn't and you do. They're flowing to people who say we must wear a mask. And it's flowing to people who said we shouldn't wear a mask. Leave your opinions there and just go and say I don't care what you chose. I don't care who you voted for. I see your spirit. I see your soul. I'm looking beyond what I know about you. I discern a spirit and I don't like it, but I want to relieve you and I want to come and deliver you from that. I'm coming to take care of the spirit problem, not the earthly problem. God is coming back to set up his throne and his kingdom here, but he hasn't done it yet. So in the meantime, we need to be us. This is us. Come here, let me wash your feet, Democrat. Come here, Republican, independent. Come on, anti-vax, vaccinated. Come here, pro-mask, anti-mask. Let me wash your feet. I don't care what you choose. I care about your soul. I care about your spirit. I see something far deeper than all of that. I don't care your voter registration card. I don't care about any of this. I don't care what you drive. I don't care where you work. I'm focusing because this is me. The church is looking for Jesus. Show him Jesus. 
And when they look at you and say, hey, what's your opinion? You just say, that's not me. This is me. Come here. I love you deeper than anybody else. But I'm a homosexual. I love you more than the LGBTQ. I love you more than that. But this is what I did. I had an abortion. I love you more than that. Here, what I can promise to you is, yeah, you had an abortion. I'm, I hate that, that you got, that's not you either. But here's what I can do. I can give you something that's going to give you access to see that baby again. You can be in heaven where that child is. And you can dwell with them for eternity. You may, you may have messed up here, but that's not you either. Let me show you you. Let me show it to you on my knees. Stand right now. Musicians, come. There needs to be in this place a divine revelation of true biblical love. The church that actually says, God, wake me up at four in the morning and I'll pray for my city. There needs to be a church that says, God, I'm going out and I'm going to evangelize the hurting. I'm going to go and buy them a meal. Before I open my mouth and preach anything, I'm going to sit down with them and tell them, I love you. I am there for you. I'm going to take care of you. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to set your mind. You set it upon things above. Now set it upon the people that are called above. Set your mind on individuals right now and begin to pray for the lost. Open up your mouth. Just call their name before heaven and say, God, this isn't me. God, I'm going to show you who I am. This is me. I trust the name you put upon me. His name, Jesus, in Hebrew means salvation. You've put upon me the name of salvation. So God, let me go and show them salvation. This is me. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and show them the blood of the Lamb. Begin to pray right now. Lift up your voices. There should be no quiet prayers right now. There should be people that are crying out unto God from the depths of the their soul about a hurting world, a broken world. Come on, develop a plan right now of what you're going to do to love your world. Begin to develop a plan right now of how you're going to reach your world. Please don't just sit here and look at me. Pray, intercede. I am pulling for your compassion right now. Come on, God's putting a burden on somebody's heart to teach Bible studies. Just say, Lord, that's me. Here I am. Use me. Somebody's been feeling that call to evangelize. Say, Lord, that's me. I'm going to go into my city. I'm going to rub shoulders with people I don't agree with. And I'm going to love on them. Tell them, that's me. This is me. He's calling you out of the world. He's calling you out of the stuck place. And he's calling you to a place of depth. He's calling you to all-night prayer meetings. Say, God, that's me. Put it on me. I'll do it. He's calling you on a fast right now. Just listen to him. Just do it. Fast for the broken. Don't fast to get miracles. Don't fast to get something from God. Don't fast for a blessing. Fast because your world is hurting. Let the Lord give you the true revelation of his love right now. The Lord has sent me here today to activate in some of you your calling. There's an anointing and a call here today. If you want to be used of God powerfully, I want you to stretch your hands up towards heaven right now. I want you to open up your spirit. The Lord's going to baptize you with an anointing to be used here in San Francisco. submitted to you God pour out on me that spirit so that I can be a witness in Jerusalem Judea Samaria and the uttermost that's the point of your spirit is to be a witness pour it on me today sit under that overflow If you're in here and you've been battling depression, if you've been battling fear, that's not you. 
The Lord wants to stretch out his hand right now. He wants to touch your mind. He wants to touch your emotions. He wants to show you you. Perfect love casteth out fear. He wants to show you you. He loves you enough to heal emotions today. If you're here today and you've been feeling broken, the Lord's going to show you you.